Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's Graduate in Women's STEM webinar. I'm Tracy Maurizio, a counselor with our Office of Graduate Admissions. First, I would like to thank all of you for the outstanding quality of questions that you responded with. They were all very helpful in the creation of this webinar. With that being said, each panelist has been provided with a list of questions that they'll be discussing. If you have a follow-up question, feel free to jot it down and then send it to us after the webinar. Now, I would like to introduce today's panelists. We have Dr. Lee Lagan, Associate Professor in Biology, Dr. Deanna Thompson, Associate Professor in Biomedical Engineering, Erin Kelly, current PhD candidate in Chemical Engineering, and Jen Wilcox, a current PhD candidate in Chemistry. Now, I will turn it over to Jen, who will be starting us off today. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Wilcox. I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm a third-year graduate student in the Department of Chemistry here at RPI. And the first thing I will be discussing with you today is the typical day of a graduate student here at RPI. So typically, I start my day around 7.30. I get up, I have some coffee, and then uh, I get on my way to school. I live close to campus, but I do live off campus. I think it's nice to have a little bit of separation from home and school. Um, I usually start in lab around 9 o'clock, sometimes earlier. I spend most of my morning in the lab, and then usually you know, grab lunch around 1 or 2 o'clock, sometimes later. really depends on the experiments that I'm running that day. Um, usually just find time to eat in between experiments and your work. And then the afternoon is pretty much the same, more lab. Um, you might have a seminar that you attend uh, where a guest speaker will come and they'll discuss their research with you. And there is usually free coffee, so that's always a bonus. Uh, and you might also have the TA. So depending on your funding source, whether you're funded through a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship or an internal external fellowship, you might have to spend uh, about 20 hours a week dedicated to teaching assistant duties. So uh, the days that I do have the TA are usually longer days than most because there's still work to do before and after class. And then once you finish your research for the day, um, you can usually bet on at least 9 to 10 hours of it. You have time for extracurricular activities. Um, sometimes you can play a sport like Ultimate Frisbee, that's really popular here, um, or join student government. It really depends on how much time you have. Um, and a lot of students like to hit up the gym after lab as well. So um, after your first semester or two here at RPI, you'll start thinking about your thesis, um, if not earlier. This will depend heavily on your advisor and the type of work that your advisor does. Some advisors will have projects almost completely planned out for you, while some give you a lot of freedom in deciding what your thesis is going to be. And you'll find advisors across that spectrum. Um, it's also really important to find an advisor that you work well with um, and pick the correct advisor for you, which you can take into account when you're sorting through graduate schools and departments you're going to apply to. Um, I had complete control over my thesis uh, when I met with my advisor to start discussing it, which was actually a pretty daunting task. Um, I spent many, many hours brainstorming ideas and coming up with different thoughts and different you know, research proposals that I thought could work for me. Um, your thesis has to be a novel idea, so you have to make sure if you came up with the idea, someone hasn't already beat you to the punch and they haven't done it already. So you pretty much spend a lot of time uh, online researching articles, as well as in the library. Um, and then you finally find that one idea that you really like, your advisor okays it, it fits in with their research, and you can start working on your proposal. And I spent probably a semester developing um, my proposal, uh, my research plan, the timetable for getting it done, um, and this was all uh, recorded in a formal proposal, and I had to present that to my PhD committee, and they have finally approved my thesis um, in May. So that was about a semester-long activity there. Um, 
So I really enjoyed the fact that I got to come up with my own thesis and develop it myself, whereas some of my um, peers kind of were given a specific project they had to do. Again, this really depends on the advisor you choose. Um, I also wanted to discuss uh, how I feel as a woman in STEM and why I find this kind of a rewarding career path. Um, I think it's a very challenging career, um, and that's what makes it so rewarding to me. And I think a lot of us have grown up seeing certain gender roles portrayed to us, a lot of traditional gender roles, like women as teachers, secretaries, assistance. Um, I had a lot of my family members suggest I really shouldn't be pursuing a career in STEM uh, because of these traditional roles. Um, and I kind of like the idea that I can kind of challenge those roles and show that, you know, every woman can kind of choose their own path, whether they want, you know, to define their um, own careers, whatever way they want to do it. Um, I feel like I'm kind of challenging those traditions and doing what's rewarding for myself, which is what I feel is the most important part of choosing a career. And I like to the fact that I can kind of show other women they can do what they find interesting, no matter what it is. That's all I have to say. Yes. Yeah. My name is Deanna Thompson. I'm an associate professor in biomedical engineering. I'm also the graduate program director of biomedical engineering. I received my bachelor's from the University of Michigan in chemical engineering. I did my master's and PhD at Rutgers University in chemical and biological engineering. I moved to do my postdoc at Harvard Medical School um, and before joining Rensselaer in 2004. Um, I have two kids. Um, two boys, three-year-old and eight-year-old, um, two dogs, and a husband. Um, I am pretty busy doing lots of different things. I have lots of hats that I wear at RPI. Um, I'm also um, the SWE advisor. I'm also, um, you know, outside of Rensselaer, I'm on the board of directors for the Samaritan Rensselaer Children's Center. I'm also the co-PTO president of my son's elementary school. So um, how I balance research, family, and, and work is truly because um, of my relationship with my husband. The two of us share um, parenting duties. We're both involved with the kids. Um, when I have a meeting and I have to travel, he's 100% comfortable in kind of doing the things that I normally do at home. So really, it's a partnership between the two of us. In terms of balancing work and research, my actual work um, outside of the home, it really, I think, comes down to um, parsing out what you can parse out. Um, you know, having someone who ordering groceries online, um, you know, having someone clean the house. We have excellent childcare that's available on or slightly off campus for most universities. So I think it becomes much more easy to, to, to do that, where traditionally it was more difficult. In terms of how the academic world has changed to better accommodate female faculty, um, you know, Rensselaer, unlike many institutions, um, actually has a family leave policy for both graduate students and faculty members. And this allows a graduate student who, are, who, 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 if they became pregnant or if their wife became pregnant, to actually, or in the case of adoption, would allow you to have time away from your thesis in order to, you know, basically deal with you have a new member of your family. The same thing happens as for faculty members as well. And I think what's changed over the last 10 or 15 years is that not only women are taking maternity leave pre-tenure, but men are also doing the same thing. And I think by supporting any young growing family, that actually supports everyone, and, and it doesn't necessarily make women look like they're not kind of um, you know, working as hard. It's true that um, that, uh, um, that that becoming a faculty member, there's a very short period of time when you're going from assistant to associate professor with tenure, where you have to publish, get graduate funding, graduate your first students. It's a very short, abbreviated period of time. 
um, what family leave policy allows you to do is get to extend that timeline um, if, if, that, if you need that, which I think is very important. And I think as a result, 10 years ago, women would actually wait until they had tenure before they had children. And now I think people are doing it more um, along the way. Um, what's the best way to market yourself as a graduate student interested in research? I mean, the best way to market yourself as a graduate student in research is really to get, you know, to do an REU program during the summer, get some exposure to full-time research, um, attend a conference, present your research at a conference, um, go to a SWE meeting and present your undergraduate research. Um, the first level, the way I look at it as a graduate program director, is do they have any experience in research? That could be working in someone's lab during the semester. That could be, you know, con contributing to part of a larger project. The second kind of tier is, have you done something where you've been able to present it actually in a meeting? And that's kind of a second tier, you know, accomplishment. Did you present your research at a local internal conference? Did you present it at an external conference? At a regional meeting? Um, were you involved in what type of research? Um, were you in, interested in outreach activities? Um, all of these things are, I think, very important in terms of, you know, balancing your academics and, and kind of pursuing, you know, this idea of studying science and, and, and engineering in, in the STEM fields. Um, then the next thing is if you go to these conferences, you know, interact with graduate students, interact with um, faculty members. There's often open houses. You can go ahead and, if you're interested in a program, go by their booth. Um, attend <laughs> fairs where graduate schools would be present. Contact graduate um, graduate program directors. Um, you know, tell them you're interested in either in a certain area of research or maybe you have only been exposed to one area of research, you haven't totally decided, then that's fine too. But I think the idea is to get some experience doing research as an undergraduate and um, and then have something to show for that research with with, with this, which in turn is a presentation um, someplace. And so that would be my, um, those are the type of students we're really looking for, students who've had some hands-on experience doing <coughs> some sort of research. Because being a graduate student is not is not only just being a good student, but it's also doing that research. And until you do research full time, you don't really know if you like it or not. Great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Lee Ligon. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences here at Rensselaer. Like Dr. Thompson, I'm the uh, director of our graduate program. And so what I want to talk about is actually the application process to graduate school. I want to take off, uh, jump off from some of the points that Dr. Thompson made, um, and actually that uh, uh, Jen made earlier, that um, one of the things that's uh, important to know about graduate school is that it's hard. It's a lot of work. It's been, you spend a lot of time in graduate school. And the, that's appropriate because science is hard. It's a, it's a difficult career path. That doesn't mean it's not doable, it just means that it's hard and you need to be prepared for it. So the most important thing in thinking about going to graduate school and then applying to graduate school is preparation. So when I look at an applicant for our graduate program, I look for four things. I look for research experience, I look for the classes that the student has taken and grades that they've gotten. I look at their GRE scores, and then I look at their, um, their statement of interest, their personal statement. And I would say that the two most important things in that whole package for me are classes and research experience. Classes because I want to see that people have taken the hard science or engineering classes not so much that they've done really well in them, although that always helps, but that they've tried to take the really hard classes and that they really put the effort in and they're challenging themselves and they're not just taking the easy way out at every stage. So it, it's, it's much less important to have a really high GPA but take really easy classes than it is to have a slightly less high GPA but take the really hard science classes. 
Um, because that's the background that you need to prepare yourself for a career in science and engineering. Um, and just like Dr. Thompson said, the uh, research experience is incredibly important. It is not the same thing as taking classes. Uh, you can be a really good student in classes and absolutely hate working in the lab. And it's really hard to know that if you don't have that experience. I actually encourage a lot of people who, even if they've had a little bit of research experience, maybe in a summer REU or working in a lab as an undergrad, and they're, but they're still not sure, to consider taking a year to work in a lab full time and uh, do it as a full time job before they consider going to graduate school. Graduate school is a, is a big investment in time and energy, and you really ought to be absolutely committed before you do it, because otherwise you're just going to waste your time, and you might as well do something that you really enjoy more. Um, I think that it's the right thing for a lot of people to go to graduate school, but it's not the right thing for everyone, and so it takes a lot of introspection and self-analysis to figure that out. But it also takes a lot of uh, investigation and research into what kinds of things that you actually like to do. Uh, once you get into graduate school, then you have a lot of choices to make. And um, uh, Jen was talking about uh, the kinds of uh, thesis projects that you might have. But the choices start well before that. You, in a lot of programs, you'll have to do research rotations. And you have to think about the labs that you want to do those rotations in. Uh, you want to think about the, uh, the kind of advisor you might have. You want to think about the kind of research you want to do. But even before you get to that point, you have to decide where you want to go to school. And if you're lucky, you'll get into several schools and you'll have to pick one. And I really recommend to everyone that you go, if possible, you go to that school and you visit and you interact with the, the students and the faculty. And this is absolutely especially true for women, I think, um, but for men as well. If you want, to, you want to find a place that you feel comfortable, that you feel like you're going to fit in. And so the first choice is where you're going to go to graduate school. Um, so if possible, go visit. If not possible, contact people at that school and try to imagine yourself in that environment. Do you fit in? Do you feel like that's a school that you can thrive at? Then once you're at that school, then pick a lab that you feel like you can, you can thrive in, that you get along with the advisor, you get along with everybody else in the lab. And most importantly, you really like the work because there's a lot of it. And if you don't like it, you're going to be miserable. So there's, there's a lot of choices that you have to make, but they're really important choices in terms of planning the rest of your life. Great. Thank you. Erin. So my name is Erin Kelly. I'm starting my fourth year um, of graduate work in chemical and biological engineering here at RPI. and I'm going for my PhD. I did my undergraduate work at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. Um, uh, I graduated with chemical engineering and a minor in biology. And um, my lab work falls under the, this broad definition of biotech that a lot of um, people at RPI seem to work on, and more specifically synthetic biology, um, which means I kind of do, I, I engineer microorganisms for um, potentially industrial um, uh, applications. So I have a few um, points that I'm going to talk on today. Um, the first one is, what is your advice in prepping for the GRE? So personally, I'm a bit of a procrastinate, procrastinator, and I probably didn't do the best prep that I could have, but at the same time, I think that some people put a lot of stress on prep for the GRE uh, when there are more important aspects of your application, um, like Professor Ligon was talking about. Um, a lot of people do classes, and if you're looking to get into a really competitive school that you, know, you need to have the best of the best, uh, or if that's just what you think you need to do to, um, to get through all that material, that's fine. 
Um, what I did a lot of was practice tests, and I've had a lot of people that told me that the, the they learn the best from the practice tests, especially the ones written by the people who write the GRE, because some of those themes come up over and over again, and you start to get you kind of get in a rhythm of what they're asking, what they're looking for. Um, and I'd also say that for the math, obviously as people in STEM, math, the math section should be the easiest for us. And it is, um, but they try really hard to trick you with a lot of the questions in the math section. And if you get, you know, a handful of them wrong, all of a sudden you're you're no better than any some English major because they <laughs> worked really hard on the, the math part and you just came in saying that I should be able to get this no problem. And it's true, you should be able to get it no problem, but they they try and trick you a lot. So don't don't disregard that completely. Try and do a few practice exams on that as well. Um, and then um, as far as the vocab, you might as well look up the words you don't understand on your practice test. They have flashcards. You can look up flashcards, carry around a few in your pocket. Just try not to leave it till the last week. Maybe start prepping at least a couple months in advance. <laughs> and uh, I think you'll be fine. Um, you're probably not going to do amazing on the essay writing portion unless you were, you're formally trained. So don't, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Getting like a six, that's okay. And five or a four. <laughs> um, so my second point is, what was your biggest challenge as a first year graduate student? And um, for me, it was mostly the classwork. Um, coming in, chemical engineering, a lot of the departments around the country don't require you to do a master's program. So I came in uh, directly from uh, undergrad, and so we had to complete all the coursework that you might have previously completed in your master's work. Um, so that, you know, it's higher level courses, they expect more from you, um, and they're not just looking at a grade, they're looking at um, students that are contributing to their department in uh, a very significant way, because the research that you put out eventually reflects on the department. So there's a little bit more scrutiny on you, um, which is fine. I mean, my department is full of, um, I, I really like the people in my department. Um, but it was mostly coursework, which is funny because that's not at all what I would say today. And I think if I compare my experience as uh, fourth year right now to my first year, there's no comparison, and this year is much more difficult than my first year ever was. It was kind of a time where I was getting to know everybody, getting to know the school, um, picking out an advisor, which can sometimes be very um, stressful, um, but it was pretty straightforward for me. Um, and then my third point was, do you face any discrimination for being a woman in STEM? And I had a little bit of a problem with this question. It's, I've been fortunate to not have kind of a direct discrimination pointed out at me, and by direct, I mean, you know, someone basically saying you can't do this because you're a woman or you, you failed at this because you are a woman. Um, and I think that that, that, that that I haven't come across that is um, due to, you know, people in my department and my professor is a woman. Um, most of the people in all the people in my uh, lab are. It never seems to come up as an issue. However, there's still the kind of indirect discrimination that I think every woman faces um, based on um, just you know the whole idea of little girls are clean and have a nice pink dress and little boys. Or get dirty, you know, or little girls get a Barbie and um, little boys get a Lego set. Um, and I, I struggle a lot with that. Not, not personally. My my family was very, um, they they really supported any decision I wanted to make. But 
knowing that that's kind of what young women have to face moving forward, I think it's just really important to show uh, strong leadership and very strong and, um, you know, lead leaders in their field in our, in, in STEM, leaders in um, whatever your, whatever your research may be, just showing that um, these people have a lot to offer and just because you're a woman doesn't mean you can't do research. It's, I don't know, I haven't seen a lot of that, but there's just the indirect and kind of ingrained in society, like maybe she couldn't have done that because she was a woman. But I think it's getting a lot better. But that was what I had. <laughs> Excellent point, by the way. Excellent point. Can I yeah. say one thing about the GRE scores? <laughs> As the director of graduate admissions, <laughs> yes. um, I think that there are, there are two things that I want to say. One is that even if you're applying to graduate school in science and engineering, you cannot neglect the verbal and the yeah. uh, writing sections. Not that um, we think that you do, but that the verbal, verbal skills are an absolutely essential skill in science and engineering. It's the way that we communicate our, our um, our findings, and so it's something that we we really expect our students to be uh, to have facility with verbal skills. Not that I think that's what you were saying, no, but I just wanted to emphasize that. That's fine. Um, the other thing is that a lot of schools will use the GRE scores as a, not as a cutoff, but as sort of an initial screening. Say, you know, if you have um, mediocre GRE scores and there's someone else who has an equal preparation in terms of classes and research experience. If that person has better GRE scores, then that we're going to look at that person more favorably um, until we actually get to know you. So um, it, the GRE scores, while I agree that they're probably not the most important thing in my analysis of a student's application, they do play a role, and you can't neglect them. You really, um, as Erin said, you really do have to work at it, and you have to pay some attention to uh, to preparing for them. Jen, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Uh, when you were uh, going through the application process, mm -hmm. uh, how did you narrow down your, your graduate school selection? Uh, that's a good question. So. Um, the first thing I did was I looked for programs that, um, or departments that had research that I was interested in. So you don't want to apply to a graduate school um, at a specific university because it's a great university. You want to make sure their program is the fit for you because you will be spending at least five years there. So you don't want to make a mistake and then realize, you know, you got in there, you sent in your forms, you moved maybe across the country, across the world, and you're in the wrong graduate program. So what I suggest is that you sit down and kind of really look into the type of research you want to do. Do you want to do a biotech? Do you want to do synthesis? You know, what kind of engineering are you looking into? And specifically, what problems do you want to pursue for your thesis? And then find universities that have professors specializing in those fields. And then you can kind of, you know, look into it deeper, see are they taking students. Like, you really want to be proactive about that and make sure that you find, you know, several professors at that university that you could see yourself working with for several years. Uh, you don't want to find just one because maybe he's only taking two students or, you know, she's only taking one student that year. And everybody in your class is going to be trying to rotate with them. So you want to make sure you have at least two or three professors, I think, that you can see yourself working with. Um, and, you know, I, I think I applied to nine graduate schools. Some people think it's excessive. Um, I thought it was just kind of the right amount. You know, you want a couple that are your reach schools. Um, and then a couple, I guess we still do safety schools for, you know, graduate um, admissions. So, um, yeah. I, just want to emphasize, you want to make sure you find the, the right program with the right professors that you can see yourself working with. Excellent. What about living on campus? Um, 
between you and um, possibly your peers? Do you mm -hmm. think um, it's wiser to live on campus or off campus? How, what, what's your opinion on that? Um, I think it, it really depends on um, how much separation you want between yourself and your work. I have a friend who lives right across the street from the biotech building that we work in. Like, she sees it out her bedroom window. So, you know, she can't really quite get away from it that much. Um, I mean, that's great for the days that it snows a foot and a half, and you have to go in and maintain your cell culture, whereas I have to, you know, trudge two miles through the snow because the buses aren't working. Um, but I kind of like having, uh, you know, less than a 20-minute, you know, uh, commute from my apartment here, um, not necessarily to live on campus. I know students who do live uh, in the graduate student housing on campus. Um, some really like it, some really don't. I think that's another thing you really need to invest some time in um, before you just move into an apartment with four people you don't know. Um, but personally, I like having some some distance, you know, from lab and from home. So I don't always feel like I'm under you know under pressure to be doing research reading papers and everything while I'm at home. Great. Uh, Dr. Thompson, um, on average, how long uh, does it take to complete a PhD program, on average? So from a bachelor's, it takes anywhere from four to six years, um, on average, I would say, in, in biomedical engineering. And I think it depends really on the, the nature of the project. Um, some people who do theoretical projects can, can accomplish that more quickly. Um, typically, students in my lab, um, four and a half to five and a half, up to six years, um, it typically takes to do a wet lab um, experiment. I think that's what was the average at Rensselaer between people doing um, biology, um, biomedical engineering, and the wet lab area of like chemical engineering. I think that was what I was told that, that the average was. Mm -hmm. So let's say um, that's looking five and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the typical source of funding um, for students um, that are looking at five, five and a half years? Is there um, department funding? Should they, should they think of external funding? How, do, how does that usually go? So in the biomedical engineering department, um, students enter the program as graduate fellowship, on a graduate fellowship through their Rensselaer Graduate Fellowships that the department will nominate you for. They can enter the, the graduate program as teaching assistants, um, TAing some of our undergraduate courses. They can enter the program as a research assistant actually working at someone's lab um, on a specific project already. And so most of our students typically enter, majority of our students enter as TAs or fellows. Um, there are some that enter as RAs. Then by second year, um, usually, you know, it depends either, again, a mixture of TAs and RAs. I would expect that you'd spend probably one, at least one year as a TA, up to two years as a TA, um, and then anywhere from two to three years as a, as a, as a research assistant. We also require all of our graduate students to who are eligible for any external fellowships to apply for external fellowships in their first and second year. So we have a workshop as part of our discussions in graduate research um, where students apply to the NSF graduate fellowships. All of you who are undergraduates who are eligible, the, applicate, the fellowship application is not due until November. You should really be looking and applying. If you get for your own funding, this is funding from the NSF for four years. So this will allow you to have a lot of freedom in picking your research project because the resources that a faculty member would be used are not necessarily tied to a um, particular project. Students, student costs a graduate uh, graduate advisor roughly between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year um, in terms of tuition and stipend, covering them for the full twelve months. And you know, if you add this up over five years, significant investment. So we encourage our students to apply for these external fellowships. International students are eligible for American Heart Association fellowships. Again, the return rate is, the return on these, the 
percentages of students getting them are fairly or not incredibly great. But going through the whole process of applying and writing down a research proposal, I think is a great way in your first year to start this dialogue with your grad with your advisor and really get a handle on what sort of direction you're going to take. Whereas I think most people do that when they put together their candidacy. This is kind of like a jump start on that. Great. Uh, I, I know that when we're on the road recruiting different schools, uh, a lot of students will come up to us and say, you know, what's what's my my best option? Do I go um, from a bachelor's directly into uh, a PhD program, or do I go into a master's program, go into industry, then go into PhD? Um, from the engineering perspective, what would what would you recommend? So if you know you wanted to get your PhD, um, and you know, I would ask you why you want to get your PhD. Um, doing a PhD means you're going to be running a lab, whether that's in industry or in academia or a national lab. So if you want to do that, and if you want to, you know, write grants and and write proposals and put together research programs, then I would say go for a PhD. Um, you can immediately from your bachelor's. While you're working on your PhD, usually you can get your um, master's degree along the way, so that's not a problem. If you have any con concern, like Dr. Ligon was saying, about you're not really sure, should I get a PhD, then I would say the best and the most prudent course of action is actually to do research for a year or to get a job for a period of time. Um, what that allows you to do, it gets you lots of work experience, exposure to different areas of practical experience that you've been training for. Usually at that point, you can. I worked for a year, I worked for Park Davis um, uh, Pharmaceutical Research and in cardiovascular, and, and I really loved doing research. And then after that, it was clear that I definitely wanted to go get my PhD. And so I think I was more focused because I had that year off. And you know, and I had some practical experience as well. So I would say that if you're not 100% committed, go get a job, you get paid, and most of the time your company will pay you to get your master's. Um, if you pay to get your own master's, so PhDs are usually you don't have to pay all the way through. Um, you're picked up by your advisor or the department or as a TA or, or whatnot. But for a master's program, we don't provide um, financial aid for that. In very rare if circumstances, if we have a PhD student who left the program, or um, we have a bunch of people who had got extra funding that we didn't anticipate, do we have master students get, getting any sort of TA ship? So typically, funding is primarily reserved for our PhD students. So I would say, um, you know, expect to pay for your own master's degree. Um, if you have a master's degree, you're not eligible to apply for them as a graduate fellowship. So if you're interested in doing that PhD program, apply to directly to the PhD program, apply to these fellowships. You having those two years of graduate school negates your eligibility for, for these other programs. That, that's, that's good advice, um, not just for our, um, our, our guests, but also for, uh, for us when, we, when we're speaking to prospective students as well. Uh, Dr. Ligon, um, what is your advice on um, choosing a, a mentor or, um, or an advisor when, when going to grad school? So I think it's, um, it's a, that's a subset of what I was talking about earlier. Choosing an advisor is like, um, it's kind of the same process as choosing a graduate school or a graduate program. You want to figure out if that's a, a person or a lab or a research project that, that you see yourself fitting into, that you can see yourself as contributing to. Uh, everybody has a different style. In my lab, I'm a relatively uh, hands-off advisor. I like my students to have their own independent projects and to move them forward by their own actions. I don't like to tell them what to do. I feel like they don't learn as much when I'm telling them how to do everything. Uh, other people in, in our program are very different. They like to um, tell the students or be very actively involved in what the students are doing. 
So there are a lot of different styles, and each individual student has their own preferred style. And you don't necessarily know what's going to fit you best until you try it out. So in our program, we have our students do uh, research rotations. So our students are admitted to the program. They're not admitted to individual labs like they are in some programs. And our students come in, and they have to speak to a certain number of, of graduate faculty and then choose a research rotation for uh, an eight-week research um, rotation in the fall. And then they do a second eight-week research rotation starting in November. And then they do a third one in the spring. And by the end of the first year, they've tried out three different labs. And they have the experience of three different advisors, three different mentors, three different types of research, three different uh, lab groups. And when you have that experience to, to try all those different styles, um, your, your job as a student is to figure out which fits best for you. And sometimes there's a, there's a, uh, a balance that you have to find. Sometimes you really like the research, the ideas, the, uh, the science in one lab, but you really don't like the way the lab is run. So you have to make that decision, which, you know, what is going to be more important for you for the next five years? Are you going to do, are you willing to sacrifice um, a lab that you're not as happy in for working on a question that you're really interested in? And those are completely individual decisions. Everyone has, has their own balance point, and everyone is, is going to find their own particular answer to those questions. Can I add just one thing to that? So, I mean, I kind of like in finding a lab, it's like dating. I mean, you have to kind of, you know, have these rotation experiences. Some people have group meetings on Saturday mornings. Some people have them on Friday afternoon. Some people have them at Tuesday at lunch. I mean, you have to figure out what you're going to work with. Some people, some advisors meet with them once a semester. Others meet with them every week. Others meet with them every day. So it kind of depends upon your style. This is not, I don't think this is just even a five-year commitment. I mean, truly, if you enter academia, you know, my advisor, my graduate advisor and I still chit-chat. My postdoc advisor still writes letters of recommendation for me. So it's a very long relationship. And it, there's not any way to have like a divorce, right? <laughs> Once you're in, you're in. You're kind of like in the mafia. You can't leave. <laughs> and, and you can leave the lab and go on and do something else. But you truly, it, it truly is. You have to um, make sure that the style that the lab is, which you will not change, is something that you're comfortable working with. And knowing that if you decide to make this your career in academia, that you will probably be interacting with these people for a very long period of time. The community is not that large, especially if you're working in similar research areas. So it is really finding a really comfortable place that some people who will succeed in one lab will not succeed in another lab, and vice versa, because they either need more structure at that period of time in their you know, lab career, or they need less structure because they need to kind of figure these things out and more rebel against everything that your advisor is telling them to. <laughs> so it really truly is a, a, that, you know, figuring it out. Can I add one more thing yeah, to that? Um, so the other thing that's important to know is that what you actually do your research on when you're in graduate school is not necessarily what you will end up doing your research on for the rest of your life. Um, in most fields in science, I, in most fields in science, and a lot of fields increasingly in engineering, people do postdoctoral work, um, and it's much more important to pick a postdoc that is more closely related to what you really are interested in in working on. I mean, I don't mean making 180 degree shifts and you know, working in, um, you know bacteria in one um, lab and then working in you know, plants in another lab. Uh, I mean, slight shifts or, or sometimes even more, more significant shifts. Um, 
going to graduate school is more about learning how to be a scientist than it is about learning a particular research problem. Uh, so my argument is that you should pick the lab that you feel the like you fit in the best over the research question that you're the most interested in. But like I said, that's a that's a different people have right. different levels of um, of comfort about those that balance. Um, can I just go back one more <laughs> thing to the master's question? So I think the the masters in some different fields it means something different. In biology, with some very specific exceptions, there's not much use for a master's in biology. And in fact, actually, we hardly ever accept master's students into our program because unless that person has a very particular reason for it, there's there's not much use for it. Um, if, you're, if you don't have a PhD in biology, you're not going to get a job that is, um, that is going to be worthy of having gone to grad school. Um, having a master's degree in, for most people in biology is, um, gives you a slight bump in some you know, pharmaceutical industries uh, but it doesn't fundamentally change what kind of job you're going to get. So, you know, without a PhD, you're going to be basically working in a lab. Whereas with a PhD, you're going to be directing a lab, or at least having more of a role in directing the, the direction of the lab. Um, so I always ask people to really think about why they want to get a master's degree versus why they want to get a PhD. And recognizing that it is, there are differences for different fields, and then even some subfields. Like, for example, um, in uh, some subfields of biology, like uh, in ecology, um, the, where there are a lot of government jobs, that the master's degree actually does give them additional opportunities that a bachelor's degree doesn't give them. Uh, there are some, there's some utility for getting a master's degree. But if you want to do biomedical research, there's not a lot of function for having a master's degree. Mm -hmm. no, excellent point. Um, I know that we only have a few minutes left. And um, I just wanted to touch base on a couple of uh, graduate application questions. Um, they're, they're very popular, um, <laughs> as, uh, as everyone knows. So Erin, let me ask this question to you. Um, how, when you were preparing your graduate applications uh, or application, um, how did you connect with a professor when asking them or prepping them for a letter of recommendation? Like, what was your what was your game plan for that? So I decided I wanted to go to grad school about my junior year, and I really started um, trying to become more involved in like getting to know my professors a lot better. I chatted with our graduate student advisor a lot, and I was in class with her. And basically, um, I looked for professors that I had a bit of a rapport with and who I had been in classes with, and, and in those classes I'd done well, or at least, you know, improved over time in those courses. Uh, and I, I also asked, like, uh, professors I'd done in undergraduate research with and um, that were involved with clubs that I was involved in. So I really looked for people that knew me or that, that I don't know, I know some students in my uh, year just kind of went up to a professor teaching a senior course that they were in and asked for a letter of recommendation. And they didn't have much more of a relationship with them than that. And so it's really good that they can not only write like, oh, they did well in my class, but oh, I know them from this and this, and they're, they do good research, or they're reliable, or they're very you know, enthusiastic, or whatever that might be. So I'd say it's, it, it makes a difference to get to know your professors at your undergrad when asking for recommendation letters. Just to add to that, from like a faculty member's perspective, I think it's really good to go, um, if you're gonna ask them to 
write letters of recommendation at multiple schools to give them a sheet that has all of the due dates on it. And if there's any self, anything has to be mailed by snail mail to give them an addressed envelope that's stamped, that's ready to go. Um, to remind them the week before those deadlines start rolling in, hey, you said you do this, this is, you know, here it's coming up, this is the date, and then ask for some sort of confirmation that it was actually <laughs> sent. Usually the graduate school is not going to ding you for a letter, one letter of condition being late, but it does prevent your application from a graduate committee's perspective looking at a complete application, so you want to make sure that's in and you want to follow up to make sure your application is complete. I think the other thing is giving your um, letters recommendation writer you know, a copy of your essay or at least discussing with them what your future plans are and providing them with your CV and just maybe highlighting a couple points that because of their interaction with you that they could actually speak to. But if you highlight it on their CV, then it's something that just reminds them when they sit down to write a three or four letters recommendation for that week that you know you can tailor that letter to that school and don't just give them one week to yes. write your letters <laughs> try to give people as much time as possible i prefer people to give me at least a month's warning um, i don't necessarily write them a month in advance but if i have that warning i can schedule my time more appropriately Great. well we are almost out of time uh, so I would like to thank our four panelists uh, for joining us today, and I would like to thank all of you for attending our session.